Today we are taking a look at the ethics debate over using animals for scientific research and the activist groups who have targeted researchers and in some cases even called for their assassination. This summer, animal rights activists targeted the CEO of Novartis Pharmaceuticals by publishing photos of his mother's vandalized grave and burning his vacation home in Switzerland. Then there was the incident in the summer of 2008 in Santa Cruz, California. Two firebombs destroyed a car outside the campus home of one researcher and torched the front door of another. Authorities say the Santa Cruz attacks marked a transition from threats and harassment to acts of terrorism and attempted homicide. Two months ago, researchers at UCLA wrote in the Journal of Neuroscience that it is time to speak out and face the threats head on. They wrote, quote, Academic institutions and individual researchers have opted to remain silent about the activities of animal rights extremists and organizations. Such reasoning was based on the fact that unless the attacks were directed at you or your institution, it would be unwise to draw attention by offering a response. This attitude is no longer tenable, unquote. Now, a Gallup poll from May asked people's opinions on using animals in scientific research. 57% said they find it morally acceptable, 36% called it morally wrong, and 5% said it depended on the situation. We are bringing in our blogger bunch for their insights. Is using animals for scientific research beneficial, a necessary evil, or just evil? While I chat with them, Reggie is keeping an eye on what you are saying. I imagine it's a lively debate. Well, it's interesting what you just showed, that Gallup poll showing that most people believe that it is ethical to test on animals. But one of our Twitter responders, Jennifer, says it's not. And she points uh, she makes two points. First, she says that it's commonly known the effects of most compounds, so continuing to test on animals is ineffective. As she goes on to make another point, saying many tests on animals don't take into account count the variation of human versus non-human biologic constructs, thus the tests are irrelevant. So the two points there again, and well, one, uh, that the tests are irrelevant because humans are different than animals, and then the other one, which I'm sure our bloggers would talk about, is the fact that we continue testing over and over again for the same thing when we already know the results. So I'll be interested to see what they have to say. All right, definitely put those questions to them. So let's introduce our blogger bunch right now. First up, I want to welcome Dr. Ray Greek, who opposes testing on animals. He's the author of the book, The the Human Cost of Experiments on Animals. Dr. Greek, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Also want to say hello to researcher Michael Cohn. He is in favor of using animals in scientific research. He co-authored The Animal Research War. Want to say hello to you, Michael. Thank you for having me, Namwa. We also have with us animal activist Peter Young, who comes to us from the voice of the voiceless.org. Hello to you, Peter. Hi, thank you. And finally, let's welcome Tom Holder, who started the group Protests in Direct Response to Animal Extremism. A final welcome to you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, I want to start by giving each side an opportunity to put forth your argument. Uh, let's start with you, Michael, because you're a scientist at a university that does use animals in scientific research. Uh, tell us in what way you feel this has benefited, uh, benefited us in terms of quality of life. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Namwa. First of all, the law says you have to test in animals before humans. There's no question about that. That's the law. And if you look at recent history, things like polio, tuberculosis, smallpox, they're almost gone from the planet. These are triumphs of animal research. People live longer and healthier lives than ever. If your aunt is being treated for breast cancer, if your kids and pets are healthy because they're immunized, if your dad had heart surgery, if you have a new hip, you owe a debt to animal research. Heparin that prevents strokes is made from pig intestines. The next time you take your kid to the pediatrician for a diagnosis, you're using animal products. Immunizations for H1N1 are made in eggs. Everything from pregnancy tests to rubella diagnosis comes from animal research and animal products. All right, well, let's take a look at that example of H1N1 because that's a, a recent phenomenon that we're dealing with. We've got about 1,000 people who have died as a result of the virus thus far. About 17,000 people have been hospitalized here in the U.S. So, Dr. Greek, w would you like to see vaccines such as an influenza vaccine not be created if indeed they are reliant on animal testing uh, to, to, to be successful? Well, with, with all due respect to Michael, that's just not the case. I'm a physician and my wife is a veterinarian, and we have frequently been confronted with the fact that drugs and diseases act very differently in animals than they do in humans. 
and I'll go one step further. I've had to deal with the fact that different humans respond very differently to drugs and diseases. Even identical twins frequently react differently. Now, science understands why this is so because of things like the Human Genome Project and our studies of evolutionary biology and so forth. And in our book, Animal Models in Light of Evolution, we discuss this in considerable depth. Now, I can't go into that kind of depth today, but the take-home point is that animals simply cannot predict human response. And yet that is exactly how the people who earn their livelihood from using animals sell that animal use to society. And that's just fraud, plain and simple. Of course animals and humans have things in common, and of course you can grow things using animal eggs and so on and so on. But that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not they predict human response. And they just don't. All right, so let me ask you then, Tom, do you feel the same results, the same advances uh, in medical science could be achieved without animal testing? No, I think that uh, animal, without animal research, we'd see the progress of medicine slow down potentially to a stop. I mean, whatever uh, Dr. Greek says, the fact is, is that every single medical advance, we're not just talking about most, we're talking about just about every single medical advance in human history has, uh, has come about because of uh, research using animals. Now, I accept that there are uh, differences. There are also overwhelming similarities between uh, humans and animals, and it is these similarities that allow animal research to be a crucial tool. The fact is, if we had other methods, I mean, I'm not quite sure what Dr. Greek is intending, that we just stop all types of testing. I'm not quite sure how this is going to develop new medicines. So the medical community is constantly keen to find alternatives because animal research is so expensive. And if we could find a much cheaper alternative, we would use it. Uh, can I just ask, Dr. Greek, is that what you want to see? You want to see an end to all animal testing? No, that's a straw man, and it's insulting. Of course we don't want to see an end to all testing. We want to see an end to testing that doesn't work. If you think animal models are predictive for humans, then you should never eat chocolate again because chocolate kills dogs. And yes, dogs and humans have a lot in common, but drugs that work in dogs don't work in humans and vice versa. And that's the problem. All right, I want to uh, have a, a look at the statistics here, or the, the, the data on the animals that are being tested on, just to get a better sense of what we're talking about. Uh, we've got, for example, less than a quarter of 1% of the animals in laboratory testing are non-human primates. We're talking about chimpanzees, etc. Less than half of 1% are dogs and cats. 95% are rodents, uh, rice, uh, sorry, mice and rats, for example. Now, Peter, when we look at that last category, 95% are rodents. In the home, many people, for example, will see those kind of animals as pests, and um, they may essentially kill those in the home. Do you see any challenge in equating the rights of, say, a mouse or a rat with those of, say, a child who has diabetes? Because insulin, for example, was discovered as a result of testing on uh, fish and dogs. I don't see any contradiction at all. As a matter of fact, the animal rights movement is attempting right now to expand people's consciousness so that they look at um, all creatures that have sentience to have the ability to suffer as having worth and having um, and having rights. And so, if you cut open a rat, um, it bleeds just like you and I do, and therefore, its uh, its its uh, interests are worthy of consideration. So, I consider it totally abhorrent um, to uh, take a rat and blowtorch it just to simply see the results or or so many of the things that these sadistic scientists carry out in their research laboratories. Um, I consider that to be totally morally abhorrent. So, uh, Peter, you were in prison on charges relating to fur farm raids. And when we look at the information uh, on um, uh, incidents of activity by animal rights activists, we find, for example, 317 incidents uh, between 1999 and, I'm sorry, 1997 and 2008, including fire bombings of researchers' homes and cars, breaking and entering, vandalism, stealing property, and acts of intimidation. So, Peter, uh, when you look at the suffering of an animal and then the suffering that is inflicted upon a researcher as a result of these violent acts, uh, why is violence in that case justified? 
Well, any discussion on violence when it comes to animal research or meat or what have you needs to focus squarely on the people committing the violence who are the animal researchers, people like Mr. Khan that we have here today, um, people that by, for a living inflict suffering on animals. I mean, vivisection by its definition is the cutting open of live animals. So when you look at someone like Mr. Khan, look at him and remember that's what he does for a living every single day. So when I, think, when I hear something like that, I think how dare these scientists um, act like the victims when they're the ones victimizing animals, 20 million animals every single year in their laboratories. They're the ones that are inflicting the suffering. They are the ones who are creating the victims. Animal rights activists are simply trying to save animals. We're a compassionate movement. Michael, what do you make of that label of vivisector? Well, like, like so much else, uh, Peter's facts are wrong. I don't, in fact, work on animals. Uh, I have in the past and I may in the future. But the truth is that real heroes of social movements people like Martin Luther King, people like Gandhi, and the Dalai Lama, who, by the way, supports ethical use of animals in research, they don't threaten people's lives or families or put bombs on their doorstep. They don't threaten their kids. They don't follow their kids. They don't mail them razor blades. We're not talking about loving animals here. We're talking about hating people. I mean, Peter should have known that when he released 10,000 captive bred animals, they did not have the skills necessary to survive. He was sentencing them to a death sentence. The animals he released over a several year period died of dehydration. They died because they were unable to get food. Uh, Bambi was a pleasant cartoon, but it doesn't reflect what happened when you release 10,000 animals to the wild. I just want to briefly, Peter, give you an opportunity to respond to that, this, uh, this suggestion that the animals you released actually were essentially being released to their death. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, mink are native to North America. Um, when they get released, we had a mink release right here in Utah. Um, there are still police reports every single day of mink turning up um, um, near the farm that are living just fine. Um, there have been whole portions of the United States where the mink population have been wiped out by trappers, um, and that species has been reintroduced because of groups like the Animal Liberation Front releasing mink. So I totally contest that. All right. Well, let's uh, find out now what people are saying online, because, Reggie, you were saying earlier that you were finding a bias towards those who had ethical concerns with animal testing. Well, at least just in one of the Twitter posts. But I'll say that overall in our Facebook uh, posts, we're seeing exactly what we're seeing in your panel today in Amwa. They're split. We're going to start with Serene, who says, all animal testing are inhumane and should be banned, period. Our next Facebook comment comes from... See, uh, Cuthbert, who says, I believe God created all creatures as equals. None is more special than the other. We should find alternative methods. But then listen to Sue, who says, I love animals as much as the next person, but if it saves my kids' lives, I say do it. We're going to end up on Shauna, who says, I'm 100% against it. Animals have no choice in the matter. They're forced into it, often bred for it. There are plenty of humans who would and do offer themselves up for testing. So let me ask Dr. Greek then that question. We've talked a lot about uh, specifically animal testing, but what about the alternatives? If, if animal testing isn't the way to go, doctor, what should we do instead? What we should do instead is called personalized medicine, and that's what the pharmaceutical industry is focusing on now. The pharmaceutical industry is trying to get away from animal testing, and they're trying to use human genes to test on that come from human beings so that a drug that works on you might not work on me and vice versa. The answer to predictive technology is human-based, not testing on humans in the Nazi sense of the word, which the opposition so commonly tries to portray, but testing on human tissue, specifically human genes, so that we can design drugs for individual human beings. Uh, I want to uh, get us back to this issue of if you do feel strongly against animal testing, how you protest that. Um, because we are reading uh, recently in the Journal of Neuroscience that some research scientists are taking a public stand against activists, describing them as terrorists. I'd like to uh, introduce a quote to you from Professor Gentcher of the University of California who says, quote, <coughs> The practice long followed by many researchers of keeping quiet and hoping the activists will go away does not work. We have to take them on directly. Now, uh, Tom, since you are uh, the founder of ProTest, tell us about how you do go about this. Well, I marched side by side with Professor Yench at the UCLA protest rally in April of this year in which uh, around 800 students and scientists marched through the streets of L.A. in support of life-saving medical research. 
On the other hand, around uh, 40 or 50 animal rights activists turned up to uh, oppose, oppose this action. They were the original rally scheduled at that point. So uh, the point is that actually public opinion is very much on side with animal research for most people. The problem is, is it's not the kind of issue which most people like to speak up about. So most people have been a sort of silent majority, and what we need to do is get them, give them back a voice and get them to speak up on this issue. The fact is, is that most people have had family whose lives have been saved or greatly improved through animal research. Cancer survival rates are through the roof thanks to drugs like tamoxifen, Herceptin, which have been uh, tested and developed using animals. Uh, and so... I think that what we need to do is get a great understanding of what animal research is about. People need to know that the conditions in labs are spectacularly uh, improved from the sort of pictures we see of 60s research or research in countries, uh, third world countries. It simply isn't like that in the US or in the UK. Uh, we have 24 hour uh, attention and care from lab technicians, from veterinarians. I mean, people forget that most of the treatments that they give their pets at home uh, were all developed through animal research in laboratories. So uh, I really believe that if you believe in both animal health and you believe in human health, then actually you should be on side with animal research. Yeah, it's very interesting also, Tom, that you're joining us from the UK, where this is a very inflammatory uh, topic. Um, I can see you there, Peter, uh, shaking your head as you listen to Tom. Uh, there has been an argument made that the animals that are kept for animal research do live, for example, longer lives than those uh, who may be in the wild. But I, I sense that you don't agree with that. Uh, tell us your thoughts. No, not at all. All you have to do to, to learn that Mr. Holder is lying to you is to go to Google News right now and type in animal research. The first story that will come up, uh, I just did this a minute ago, is a, uh, an investigation that was just done. There's a press conference happening right now, just three blocks from where I am, uh, about an investigation at the University of Utah. There are pictures on that news story at the Salt Lake City Tribune that show exactly what's going on inside laboratories right now. So uh, Dr. Khan and uh, Mr. Holder are lying to you. Uh, these, what's happening to animals, these pictures you see are not outdated. This is happening every single time. Anyone cracks that veil of secrecy and goes inside a lab, they come out with horrific images every single time. All right, so there's what's uh, happening to the animals, and obviously there's disagreement about that, and there's also what's happening to uh, the researchers. I can see you uh, there, Michael, shaking your head. I, I just, I know that you yourself have been uh, harassed uh, for the work at your university, uh, the testing on animals, and we can actually show you um, what nature that takes, because from 1990 to 1999, 61% of the incidents, the protest incidents, were aimed at universities, only 9% at individuals. From 2000 to 2009, 12% were aimed at universities, 47% at individuals like you, Michael Kahn. Tell us how this impacts your life. Sure. Well, I think first it's fair to say that there is no end of young people who are excited to go through the drama of becoming an undercover plant and doing whatever is necessary to create the impression of poor animal care in order to appease their handlers. The fact is animal research is overseen by the federal government, by the USDA. Researchers and the USDA don't tolerate bad actors. The film Peter's talking about was taken over an eight-month period. If these people really saw something wrong, why did they wait that long to come forward? Ethical researchers here and at all facilities are trained and are they required to report problems immediately. Why wait eight months if there's really something wrong? And I just want to, uh, Dr. Greek, give you an opportunity to wrap this up. Uh, we hear from Michael Conner describing it as ethical research. Uh, is that possible in your opinion? Well, I think the ethics goes back to humans. And I'd just like to comment on what you opened with. Doctors Ringach and Yench, who wrote that letter to the Neuroscience Journal saying that they should engage more with the public, that's disingenuous. I've offered to debate Dr. Ringach and Yench many times, and they have always turned me down. The animal experimentation community does not want an open dialogue on this. They want pro to propagandize the general public. And I would challenge uh, Michael Kahn. Michael, if you're so convinced that you're right on this issue, let's have a public debate in Portland, Oregon. That's where your university is. Your university can provide the security. We can have the debate at OHSU. So if you're convinced that you're right, how about it? I know. Yeah, sure. that. Go ahead, Michael. And then uh, Dr. Greek knows very well that we've had discussions in the literature before. Uh, we've pointed out problems in his fact-gathering. 
uh, my co-author of the Animal Research War, documented the vast majority of the quotes that Dr. Greek uses in his books, and we were able to show that when you trace them back to the origin, they bear very little resemblance to the original quote. They've undergone some sort of literary photoshopping. When you find the individuals who these quotes are attributed to, or to in most cases, they will distance themselves from the quote, saying, this is not my opinion, it's not what I said, and it's so far taken from context as to be unbelievable. So we, we've done that experiment a number of times. Also in the book, we take Dr. Greek on uh, head on. In the animal research war, we talk about a number of his issues. And uh, if he'd like, I'm happy to send him a copy, no charge. All right. Well, the so, word so war, no. obviously, for the record, that's being appropriate no. here. Okay, it sounds like uh, it sounds like yes, the two of you have had this discussion at length, uh, no, at least in, in writing. Um, so we'll let you we'll let you guys discuss this, uh, I guess, outside of these uh, four walls. But for now, I want to thank you all very much for an interesting conversation. That was Dr. Ray a Greek, whose books include Sacred Cows and Golden Geese and the Human Cost of Experiments on Animals. Michael Cohn from the Oregon Health and Science University, author of the Animal Research War. Peter Young, an animal rights activist who you can find at voicesofthevoiceless.org and Tom Holder who started Protest. That's a group supporting research founded in response to animal activism. That's protest.org.uk. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Good health to all. Welcome bunch right now. First up, I want to welcome Dr. Ray Greek, who opposes testing on animals. He's the author of the book, The Human Cost of Experiments on Animals. Dr. Greek, welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Also, want to say hello to researcher Michael Cohn. He is in favor of using animals in scientific research. He co-authored The Animal Research War. Want to say hello to you, Michael. Thank you for having me, Namwa. We also have with us animal activist Peter Young, who comes to us from the voice of thevoiceless.org. Hello to you, Peter. Hi, thank you. And finally, let's welcome Tom Holder, who started the group Protests in Direct Response to Animal Extremism. A final welcome to you, Tom. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, I want to start by giving Terry evil, or just evil, while I chat with them. Reggie is keeping an eye on what you are saying. I imagine it's a lively debate. Well, it's interesting what you just showed, that Gallup poll showing that most people believe that it is ethical to test on animals. But one of our Twitter responders, Jennifer, says it's not. And she points, uh, she makes two points. First, she says that it's commonly known the effects of most compounds, so continuing to test on animals is ineffective. Uh, she goes on to make another point, saying many tests on animals don't take into account the variation of human versus versus non-human biologic constructs, thus the tests are irrelevant. So the two points there again, Amwal, one, uh, that the tests are irrelevant because humans are different than animals, and then the other one, which I'm sure our bloggers will talk about, is the fact that we continue testing over and over again for the same thing when we already know the results. So I'll be interested to see what they have to say. Definitely put those questions to them. So let's introduce um, UCLA. Wrote in the Journal of Neuroscience that it is time to speak out and face the threats head on. They wrote, quote, Academic institutions and individual researchers have opted to remain silent about the activities of animal rights extremists and organizations. Such reasoning was based on the fact that unless the attacks were directed at you or your institution, it would be unwise to draw attention by offering a response. This attitude is no longer tenable." Unquote. Now, a Gallup poll from May asked people's opinions on using animals in scientific research. 57% said they find it morally acceptable, 36% called it morally wrong, and 5% said it depended on the situation. We are bringing in our blogger bunch for their insights. Is using animals for scientific research beneficial and necessary? Each side an opportunity to put forth your argument. Uh, let's start with you, Michael, because you're a scientist at a university that does use animals in scientific research. Uh, tell us in what way you feel this has benefited, uh, benefited us in terms of quality of life. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Namwa. First of all, the law says you have to test in animals before humans. There's no question about that. That's the law. And if you look at recent history, things like polio, tuberculosis, smallpox, they're almost gone from the planet. These are triumphs of animal research. People live longer and healthier lives than ever. If your aunt is being treated for breast cancer, if your kids and pets are healthy because they're immunized, if your dad had heart surgery, if you have a new hip, you owe a debt to animal research.
Today we are taking a look at the ethics debate over using animals for scientific research and the activist groups who have targeted researchers and in some cases even called for their assassination. This summer, animal rights activists targeted the CEO of Novartis Pharmaceuticals by publishing photos of his mother's vandalized grave and burning his vacation home in Switzerland. Then there was the incident in the summer of 2008 in Santa Cruz, California. Two firebombs destroyed a car outside the campus home of one researcher and torched the front door of another. Authorities say the Santa Cruz attacks marked a transition from threats and harassment to acts of terrorism and attempted homicide. Two months ago, researchers at